Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm joined by my co-host, Yoni Mazur, and today's guest, Laura Meyer. Laura, how are you? I'm wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here today. We are so excited to have you on, dear. Thank you for being here. So everyone, Laura is the founder and CEO of Envision Horizons, which is an Amazon-centric growth agency focused on helping brands build awareness, gain market share, and drive profitability through Amazon's expanding suite of advertising, retail media, and commerce capabilities. So Laura, we're going to talk about Envision Horizons a little bit later in the episode, but right now we want to understand you and your entrepreneurial journey to to envision essentially how did you get to where you are today so the floor is all yours my dear well thank you so in many ways my entrepreneurial journey started at a very young age so my father owns or used to own a hardware store in michigan with his twin brother so i always joke that like classic uh you know just like uh, Midwest family, our family vacations were going to the True Value and Ace Hardware trade shows in Vegas and Orlando. So I've basically been walking conferences since I was a little girl. <laughs> um, and I By the way, which not, part of Michigan? I'm from Northern Michigan. So Petoskey is my hometown. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's very beautiful. It's very much a resort area. I was a townie growing up because <laughs> uh, a lot of people from Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, Columbus, they all have their summer homes, but I was a, it, a local. Was it the UP, Upper Peninsula kind of area? or Very close. So my hometown is about 30 minutes from the Mackinac Bridge that connects the lower and upper peninsula. Yeah, I used to live in Michigan and uh, Detroit actually for a little while. I never got a chance to go up there, so hopefully one day. Yeah, it's it's very beautiful. You don't it, growing up there, you don't appreciate it until you move away. But that's hundred percent. I feel like anywhere. <laughs> you yeah, grow up. that's true of most things. Did you at all work as a young child in the hardware store? Because I remember my parents yes. ran an HVAC company when I was a kid, and my mom <laughs> would like let me answer the phone and take messages, which I wasn't do it. They were just humoring me. They were like, I, you, we don't have a sitter today. Answer the phone. That's fine. Just put them on hold. <laughs> Absolutely. So when I was really young, uh, I would be the bad girl. So I had, I grew up with two older brothers. They were eight and 11 years older. So they were always working in the store and I was the little seven year old, six year old running around helping do various chores. But yeah, similar to what your parents did. I, I have memories on Saturdays. My parents, you know, maybe had some event locally and they would just drop me off at the store like it was a plug in babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up, at, you know, mixing paint in the paint department, running the cash register. And, you know, it was interesting because a lot of my dad's employees in the store were all we, a, a good majority of them were retired you know, electricians or plumbers or people who, you know, they had a full-time career, but then they wanted a part-time gig to keep them busy. And those are great employees because they know all about the merchandise and the use cases. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, being in the sixth grade teaching uh, some of my dad's employees, like how to use the cash register, how to use the computer. <laughs> Uh, because when you grow up with it, it's just second nature where for some of them, it was a very daunting task back in like the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. So did you have aspirations to either take over your dad's store or run your own retail store? Or did you kind of say like, I want real vacations moving forward. Never mind, This isn't <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, the thought of taking over the hardware store never really crossed my mind. And I've always been one to pave my own path. And it's interesting. So my oldest brother after college moved to New York City. So remember, he's 11 years older. We visit him. And I remember going to New York City. I would have been, if he would have been 21, I would have been like 10, 11. And I remember... I have this vivid memory of seeing this businesswoman in a suit walking around Midtown 
and just saying with to confidence. myself, with yeah, confidence. like manifesting in that moment of like, that's what I want. I don't want to be mixing paint in the paint department the rest of my life. Like I want to be the fancy lady in the suit in the city. Uh, and it was wild because, you know, years later when I graduated college, I, I made it happen. I moved to New York city without a job lined up yet. Uh, like basically just bought a one-way ticket two weeks after college graduation, found a internship, like a quasi paid internship as my transitional role. And within a few months, that's actually how and when I landed the job with Amazon. Wow. So we so you landed a job a in New York City with Amazon? Yeah. That, Seattle? that was my first real job was they had just opened up a New York office for mm. the media team. And they had rolled out this wonderful program where they were taking professionals who were more green, whether they had zero to two years work experience and putting them through this whole boot camp. And I was part of that program. And you said that it was the media team. So did you pursue a media degree or an advertising concentration? What was your education? Yeah, so I went to Miami of Ohio and I studied business marketing with a minor in entrepreneurship. Hold on, what did and you say? Miami of Ohio, what does that mean? There's a city in Ohio called Miami. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so it's in Oxford, Ohio. It's super confusing because there's Oxford, there's Miami, but it's its own uh, place. And it, it has a wonderful business school, which is what had originally tr attracted me to the university. And also, as I alluded to earlier, I always wanted to do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And no one from my high school was in attendance there. So I wanted a fresh start. <laughs> And just to go somewhere where I'm not already already going to know like 20 people from my high school. Because growing up in Michigan, most of my friends went to University of Michigan or Michigan State, which are wonderful schools. But I want to do something a little different. But you want to break the mold, yeah. Yep, exactly. Nice. And um, so you became part of this, this program, which enormous guts it takes to move to New York one on your own two with no job lined up. So kudos <laughs> to you. That is, that is so brave and bold. So what was this program initially? And then how did it evolve into a full-time position? Well, so I had started an internship with just a business development firm that, you know, it was based off of WeWork. I don't even know if the business still exists today. And what was really amazing about that program was I basically was just tasked with go meet and network as with as many people as possible in New York City, which is what you need to do to land a great job anyways. And so they like this company ended up get, offering me a full time role, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted. And how I eventually got the interview and the job at Amazon was I every day would be scrolling LinkedIn job postings. And I saw this opportunity at Amazon. Um, to me, Amazon was, this role was super interesting because it was tying in my background of this interest in retail and knowledge of retail to what at the time was a more forefront uh, digital marketing career path. And I applied, but I also found people on LinkedIn and I messaged a few. One woman actually answered my cold message, to which I said something along the lines of like, hi, Nina. Her name is Zina. We still keep in touch today. <laughs> and I said, hey, I noticed we had a few mutual contacts. I just applied for this role at Amazon Media Group. I see that you've worked there for two years. Would you be open to a phone call or getting coffee in the city? And, you know, it's putting yourself out there that, it's how you can open your own doors. And so we had a lovely intro call and she ended up referring me internally, which I strongly believe is what got me that first interview. And then the crazy story was because I was doing multiple interviews, I actually got another job offer and the Amazon interview process took so long that I ended up accepting this other job offer. And on the very first day I joined this company, 
I get the email from Amazon HR inviting me out to Seattle for the final round in-person interview. Oh, mm. wow. And I was like, because oh, this is a lovely company and it, they were very much in their early stage. And when I eventually got the job at Amazon and I gave notice, uh, they informed me that I was the first person to ever quit this company. <laughs> they were really bummed about it. Um, and I remember feeling really bad about that. But at the end of the day, this just was the role that was better for what I aspired in my career. Yeah. And so how long, well, what year was this that you joined Amazon? I think that gives us an idea of like the e-com landscape at that time. Yeah. So this was at the end of 2014. Okay. And how long did you stay with Amazon in general and what positions did you hold? Yeah. So I worked for Amazon's media group in New York. And that first six months was, as I alluded to, this boot camp, this intensive training program. And it was really fundamental and beneficial to what I do now because they really invested in training me on the basics of digital marketing, but also the basics of how vendor central works, how seller central works, um, what is now DSP used to be AAP standing for Amazon advertising platform. Um, the crazy part was like back when I started selling their media solutions and really that was like, there was a train. So really is 2015, you know, it was so new and the tool was actually so rudimentary but you could still buy generic keywords for 10 cents a click. Like it was so much in its infancy that it was a very exciting time. And during that period, I worked on a few different groups. I was always selling their media, but I worked on the kitchen team. I worked on the grocery team. And then during that time, that was also when mobile app games were really popular. So for a few months, I also worked on the mobile apps team where we were selling ads on Kindle devices to download, you know, Candy Crush, like all of those cheesy games that sucked us all in during those years. Some of them still do. I, I just re-downloaded, uh, not Flappy Bird, Crossy Roads on my okay. phone. That, yeah, Angry that, Birds. Like yeah. there was this gold rush of all these mobile app games at the time. And so how long did you end up staying at Amazon in total, did you say? So I was at Amazon for just about a year. And the reason I ended up leaving Amazon was because at that time, I basically was given the option of I could move to Seattle and that would help progress my career. Or I could remain in New York, but I would have to work on the publishing team, which I saw as kind of a dead end for my career at that point, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. But again, like very grateful for the time I had there and it was just super insightful. Um, and then I ended up going to another ad tech company, working for them for a little over a year. And I actually closed Amazon as the being client. one of their largest clients during that period. Mm -hmm. wow. And so That's there's cool. crazy stories where like, I what? basically, I was given this short list of like, here's the big brands we want you to close. And I remember like, I'm my, my boss is asking me, you know, what's the status of Amazon? Amazon's this whale, there's huge commission on the line. And I remember I just booked a trip out to Seattle. I didn't even have a confirmed meeting <laughs> with the decision maker at Amazon. And I just played it cool. Like, hey, I'm going to be in town if you want to get lunch. And he actually came to lunch with me. Um, wow. So we ended up getting the deal across the finish line. But that was that was a wild time as well. I'm sure. It's certainly, I'm seeing a theme of it's definitely what you know, but it's also who you know, right? And making mm -hmm. those connections, reaching out and, and putting yourself out there like you had said before. So you end up at this ad tech company for about a year, close Amazon as the largest client. You leave there. Is mm -hmm. this when Envision Horizons is built or is there another this step is, in between? No, that that's that's the beginning of it is I essentially used my commission from that deal <laughs> to 
start Envision Horizons at the age of 25 out of my New York City apartment. And I, you know, at the time, and, and I'll be very transparent, you know, I, I had, I thought $25,000 was a lot of money at that point in my life, right? I'm like, oh, I can totally get started. Like I'll, I'll, I was maybe a little overly optimistic in how quick I'd be able to turn revenue. Um, so that 20, that initial 25,000 went pretty quick. <laughs> oh, a few weeks no? Like a few weeks? No, I mean, I again, like I, at that point, right. I didn't know what funding options there were, loan options, anything. Um, so I was fortunate that I was able to get some initial clients where, because it was just me, I was a glorified consultant. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had also started a men's undershirt line called a tech, which that was like a separate investment that I did. Um, in starting that, so I could also really understand the logistical side of Amazon. I knew the merchandising, the compliance and the media side but I had no idea how FBA works and how importing goods from China worked. So I started those two things at the same time. And it was also, to be honest, a way to hedge my bets of like, hey, either this private label business can go off or the agency can go off and we'll just see what business model is the most successful down the line. Yeah. And when you, you're saying you had no idea how FBA worked at the time. So did you just learn through trial and error with your own brand or did you have some resources that you leveraged to get that education? My education for FBA selling was podcast. Okay. And one of the podcasts, so there were two podcasts I used to religiously listen to. There was Manny Coates's AM PM podcast, mm -hmm. which, you know, I know he's now stepped down from helium 10 and all that. And then there I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it, I think his name was Scott Volker or something. Yeah. Does that ring a bell? I always, it does. Listen, it's like the, I think it was just like the seller podcast or something, but I used to listen to that in the early days as well. See, we, we are helping Yoni. We're helping people learn how to run their businesses. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's great yeah, to hear. an insight into this industry. That's pretty much the main idea. And, and so hopefully inspire them a little bit so they can make moves that improve their lives. Yeah, definitely. And so what ended up, I mean, obviously Envision Horizons worked, right? You're still here. We're on this podcast <laughs> talking about it. But what ended up happening with your brand? Was it also successful? Because you can have you can have two winners. <laughs> totally. Uh, so I still have it today in many ways. It's my guinea pig. <laughs> so when I have <laughs> concepts I want to test, we usually roll it out there. Um, there's no question it's taken a little bit of a back burner. In general, if you're in the apparel category and you haven't really invested in building a brand, you're in most cases competing on price. And this line of undershirts is more of a premium price point. So we had a great business during COVID and I think like a lot of private label businesses, it's, you know, declined since. Um, but at the same time, I maybe spend an hour a month on it. Maybe it's not, it's not a focus at all. Yeah, at but it's point. also a common theme within, I think Amazon team members, uh, some of them, not all of them, <clears throat> they, they sell on Amazon. They try to develop their own brand on the, on the platform. So they can appreciate what the sellers and you know are, are going through, uh, or even the consumers, are, you know. Uh, so they, I think they kind of encourage that uh, within, so they can constantly have the feedback loop now from their own team uh, being sellers. So I think that uh, serves its own purpose uh, with the envision. Yeah, I mean, a, a big part about running an agency is being empathetic to what your team is going through and also what your clients are going through. A big part of client and agency relationship is just communication and asking the right questions. You know, all relationships can have their ups and downs, but if you're able to have honest and open communication, it helps tremendously, not only with the success of the relationship, but also ultimately what you can deliver because there's that foundation of trust. Yeah, for sure.
Yeah, wholly agree. We've had a couple of guests on this show and on our sister podcast as well be leery of using the word agency because for some people it's like a bad word, but yeah. that's entirely rooted in agencies that aren't properly communicating and over communication is proper communication, right? And I think it can become very scary when the agency you're using is kind of closed off, not giving updates. Wait a minute, what am I paying you for? This is a huge line item, you know, on my my sheet at the end of the month. So, um, but to talk mm -hmm. about Envision Horizons specifically, I think the name makes perfect sense for just the short backstory of yourself that that you told us, but would love to know the etymology of the name exactly and who it is you help and and what exactly it is you help sellers with today. I have to laugh when people ask me how I came up with the name because it's actually a very practical <laughs> answer, which is that I was able to get the domain name dot yep. com. <laughs> <laughs> And I was able to get the trademark, you know, initially I had this list. I think I had like first page media.com that was taken. Um, but the, the other thing that attracted me to it is it's forward looking or thinking and it's optimistic and you need to be that way in this industry. Again, lots of volatility. You can never be complacent in our field. And so you have to be having a point of view of what the horizon holds and Yes, we do a lot of puns internally and it gets a little cheesy at times, but yeah, I mean, really the practical answer was of the 10 names I had, this was the one I could buy the domain for, you know, $20 on GoDaddy versus some of the more expensive names that I had been considering. Yeah, yeah. Nagatita said we had a similar situation. Uh, the first name was um, Intelligent Analytics, so we wanted to buy idea.com, couldn't get it. So yeah, I just said, okay, get idea.com, which became Gatita. So <laughs> practicality, once again, the domain. The domain. I, I, well, and I didn't want like the dot NYC or the dot IO or mm -hmm. uh, I want the I com, just, the com, baby. I want it. I got to get the com. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, tell us more about the service today, who you help, and, and maybe like how large your team is, where you're based out of. Just give us the whole wrap. Mm -hmm. So, in many ways, Envision Horizons has, we went through what I call a, a Phoenix era during COVID. So there's kind of the Envision Horizons BC, as in before COVID. Uh, and <laughs> there's, you know, Envision Horizons after COVID. So before COVID, it was a very different business. You have to keep in mind, right? I started this business pretty young. I was 25. And this was very much in the era where young entrepreneurs were being, I still feel like they are, but very glamorized in media. It's all about how much money you were raising. You want to be the cool hit boss where you were more of a peer than this authoritarian figure. And I had to learn a lot the hard way in those initial years. And I also had a very young team in that time because I did have an office in New York City and I was bootstrapping the business. And when you're doing those two things, hiring in one of the most expensive markets and self-funding it essentially, you have to hire more green team members. So I was, I had built this whole recruiting system to hire and train young professionals right out of college. And when you're hiring younger or more green team members, right? Like they don't have any reference points and the turnover is always higher. And that's not just for me, like that's factual because I've, <laughs> I've validated this with a lot of other corporations, even larger corporations, when they do their people planning, they assign a higher turn rate for their employees under the age of 25 than they do for their employees that are older, which is super fascinating. Um, so look, those first few years were very much trial and error. And then what really changed our business was COVID happened. And yes, there was the e-commerce boom and that helped fuel interest for the business. But I strongly believe that turning my business from being only in New York, where I could only hire a certain type of team member, 
to going fully remote and now I can hire the best talent anywhere in the country or the world was, or the world. Yes. And the world was very revolutionary for our trajectory. Cause as soon as you get really good people on your team, they're then going to do great work. Your clients are going to grow and your clients are going to stay. And, you know, again, when you have younger talent that needs to be trained, it's riskier. Like I hired some amazing people that have gone out to do fantastic things. Um, but then I also had younger team members who didn't provide the level of service that I expected. And that cost me business, it, you know, just being vulnerable and transparent in that. And those were some lessons that like a bad hire can really off road your business if you're delivering a service. So that's why today we have a very, very high threshold with the people that we hire and we make it very clear to those that we hire as well as that their first 90 days is a trial period that we need to see that they can actually do the work and they fit our company culture to a point where we can trust that we can put them on our client and they will represent us in a way that we expect. And that's been a really big learning and growth uh, journey for me because the first few people that I had to fire, which, you know, sounds really harsh, but I was so stressed out about it. I lost sleep the first few nights. Um, and part of that is my nature, I think being a woman from the Midwest was I was raised to be a people pleaser, right? Like I grew up working in retail, the customer is always right. And as a salesperson extrovert, it's in my nature to want to like people and for people to like me mm -hmm. and learning to build the business to the point where it's about respecting and fostering the right environment for those that are the right fit for your business rather than trying to appease everyone um, has been a, a journey for me, but it's, it's ultimately why we're at the level of success that we've achieved today. Yeah. Fire fast. And, and definitely it's, it's all, it's all dating, right? Like you, you, it, it has is. to match for both people. <laughs> but it's really uh, not all businesses are good at firing mm. because it has this negative connotation to it. Um, but I think those who really understand business and those who are top performers understand it, right. That there's, this risk of if you're appeasing your B and your C players and your A players are having to absorb their work, they're now going to, going to get disgruntled and there's risk that they leave. And then you're just stuck with the B and C players, which is worst case scenario. So I really work to build a system where we give career growth opportunities, obviously compensation opportunities, to those who are really delivering. And then because we do 360 reviews twice a year within our organization, and uh, we have regular check-ins, weekly scorecards, we know where everyone stands internally so that we can continue to have a high bar. Because if someone is hiring an agency, it's because they want a turnkey solution, right? That if you're wanting to just build it in house, then you're willing to roll the dice of maybe this person works out, maybe they don't. But if you want to hire an agency, it's because you're going to get more insight, more expertise and better work from the team that you get at the agency than doing it in house. And it's and so I have to approach it that way. And it's yeah. why now we're at a point where we don't even hire entry level account managers we really are only bringing on people who have at least two years Amazon experience. Um, and then we go from there. Yeah. And it's, and it's very clear that you're passionate about what you do and take a lot of care into consideration in your business. And you had mentioned being able to hire folks wherever they are, right. Not being 
stuck within just New York. Stuck might be a bad term, but, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of just in within that small bubble. So as far as the clients you're able to work with, North American brands only, global brands, particular uh, size category, what does that ICP look like? Yeah. So we, you know, a lot of our clients are in LA, New York, Miami, and then other random states within the country. And then we have a good amount of UK and German business and, and can and Canadian business as well. Um, so we're definitely global. We help brands in all of North America. So Canada, Mexico, and then we also help manage Amazon Europe. And, you know, we have team members all over the world, but our account management team is all domestic. Um, I think we, we are in a period of really building out our European offering. So our goal is by the end of the year to potentially make some account management hires that are based out of either Germany or the UK. Um, but for the most part, our East Coast account managers can oversee those businesses because of how the hours overlap. Yeah, definitely. And if folks are interested in learning more about Envision Horizons, working with y'all, questions about, you know, services, pricing, et cetera, where can they get in touch? Absolutely. So we have an intake form right on our website uh, that will go right to my inbox. <laughs> um, but also I'm very approachable and available on LinkedIn. Um, I always answer my inbox as long as no one's trying to spam me with something. <laughs> right. <laughs> and just for- If you are trying to get a job, make sure you have two years with Amazon. So Mike yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Prerequisite. And mm -hmm. for the audio listeners, the website is envisionhorizons.com and you can reach out via email at sales at envisionhorizons.com. Or as Laura said, feel free to connect with her directly on LinkedIn. So Laura, we're going to transition now into the second half of the episode, which are so more so centered around entrepreneurship and some thought leadership there. So you made the big move to New York City on your own. That's very stressful. You run an agency that's very stressful. We haven't really <laughs> talked about it in the episode, but you are a mother that's stressful. So what are some of your stress management tips that you can share with our entrepreneurs listening? Well, one of the big lifestyle changes that helps with stress management is my husband and I, we used to live in New York City. And during COVID, we sold our New York City apartment and we bought a farm in Western Massachusetts. So I am very fortunate that I can just walk outside of my office, outside of my house, and I have a very beautiful and quiet and relaxing setting that I live on and that I feel very blessed and fortunate to have. How many acres but, is that place? So we, we have 420 acres. Are you, <laughs> it's okay, like the size I have, of Manhattan, I have you know? so many questions about the farm. But. <laughs> so we, we have a trout pond. So like every morning we wake up and we feed the trout and I have my vegetable garden. So I've really found peace and and because the thing about how I relieve stress is I still have to be in motion. My mind doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. If I try and sit still, my mind still spins and I actually get more stressed wow. um, because I will think and obsess on things and then start building this to do list. And then I get stressed out about it. Yeah. Whereas with my vegetable garden, as long as my mind is stimulated by that, I can forget about the work stress. And that's been a huge thing for me um, now that I'm done having babies. So I know one, two, done. Uh, I've really been able to incorporate fitness again into my schedule and life cycle or not life cycle, um, lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Orange Theory. I do that anywhere from usually about two times a week. And then I do Pilates twice a week as well. Nice. Amazing. So in quick summary, as the kids would say, touch grass and yeah. move your body, like and get away from body. the screen and move. That's exceptional. I love that. Um, what are some of the books that you recommend entrepreneurs read or alternatively podcasts that you recommend entrepreneurs listen to? You already plugged AMPM and Scott's, yeah. um, but what else you got for us? 
So I, I want to avoid the the ones that everyone recommends. So I'm going to I'm going to yeah. I'm going to switch it up with some unique ones I've come across yeah. along the way that I that stick with me. So there's a very short book called How to Talk to Anyone. And I love this book because it actually gives you conversational tools that you can apply. And, you know, it tells you things like when people are telling a story, don't interrupt them and say, oh, me too, me too, and make it about you. Like you have to appreciate that this person is getting joy and satisfaction out of telling you this story and you need to make it more about others than trying to interject and be the one upper or the me too -er. Um, so love that book and it's a quick read. The other book I read that was really fascinating is called Quiet. So in our society, it's a very extroverted centric society. And as an extrovert, that's just the norm, right? I'm good with loud music. I'm good with crowds. I, I get energy from being with people. But when you're working with other people who are introverts, you also have to understand what brings them peace, what motivates them and how their mind works. So Quiet is a book on how to better understand introverts. And I read this because my husband is actually extremely introverted. Uh, we are very opposite, which I guess that is why we attracted because he is very analytical, studied computer science, lived in the library in college and i was the sorority girl who studied marketing who was you know on rooftops at parties so like very different right um and i think it's just so important as you grow and develop as a person and professional to really understand the differences and how people operate and it's made it, it that's that was a really great tool to also just understand how i can be a better manager to to employees who are introverted. Um, and then there's the book, What It Takes uh, by Stephen Schwartzman, the founder of Blackstone. Yeah. Um, that book is very interesting and very inspiring. And there's one quote in it that I will butcher, but it basically is something along the lines of building a business is hard. So you might as well build something big. <laughs> That even if you're running, you know, like a small little cheese shop in a hometown, you're still having to deal with employees and disgruntled customers and taxes and unexpected fees. Like those things will always happen. And even when it's at a smaller scale, it's still the same triggering type of stress. So go big or go home. That is I think awesome. they made the show Billions on, on this character, right? Uh, well, because... Show Billions? I think so. Although, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a hedge yeah, fund or whatever. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> well, anyway. Lori, you succeeded. Those are three books that have yet to be referenced on this podcast. So, yeah, there's Atomic <laughs> Habits. Like, there's all the great the classics, ones, yeah. but everyone says those. So, <laughs> they do. They do. Um, so, in addition to books, what are some tools that you are currently using that you feel have made a significant impact on your success and that you may recommend other entrepreneurs implement? This could be even basic too, like a Google Calendar, anything goes. Okay. So like software tools. Software, um, or like tools, your alarm, alarm clock, clock doesn't matter. an app, anything. <laughs> what keeps you in the frame and successful? What supplements I take. Yeah. There we go. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the business, at the end of the day, managing a service business, right? I have to have a really good understanding of what my gross margins are. Cause it's not crystal clear of like, Oh, I bought my cogs from the manufacturer. Like this is my cog. So um, we do time tracking and that's been a really powerful tool for my business. I don't charge clients by the hour, but we need to track that because one, I want to make sure clients are getting what they're paying for. And, and a common mistake that can easily happen in an agency and maybe why the agency world can sometimes get a bad rep is because if you don't have the right parameters in place, the squeaky wheel, the squeaky client gets all the attention. And this helps us set safeguards of like, 
hey, like this client, we need to make sure that we continue to bring value add because we're not, like, we can see the trends. We need to make sure we're properly allocating resources to them based on what they're paying us. And this client that's really demanding and potentially scope creeping, like now we have data points on how much input is going into their account. And then we, again, we just have a very open discussion of like, hey, we can continue this way, but we may have to adjust our pricing or like, are these sometimes rabbit holes that you're sending my team down, like they aren't necessarily moving your business forward. Are they truly necessary? Um, and then it also really helps us that when Amazon rolls out new tools, we now have a guess or a, not a guess, but a, a general idea of how many hours are allocated or how many resources have to be applied. So then we know how to properly price it because I never want to underprice and then get into an engagement where we're then disgruntled because we're actually losing money on the partnership. Mm -hmm. And I never want to overshoot it. Like I always want to be able to provide my clients with value pricing where we're both making money. That's a healthy partnership and a healthy relationship. Um, so yeah, Clockify is really great. And then we actually incorporated it into our own tool, My Horizons, where we can track the forecasted sales for our clients and then what we'll be invoicing them for so we have a real-time view of our gross margins as a as a service provider um so that's Clockify. really helpful yeah. yeah um and then you know some other tools is i'm sure people have mentioned this before but eos always comes up entrepreneurship operating system we've gone against the consultant's <laughs> advice. So we've tweaked it a little bit, but it does ultimately come down to having processes and tools internally of how you run a meeting properly within your firm. How, like what bigger goals are you holding people accountable to so that you don't get to the end of the quarter and you were just trying to stay above water the whole time and you didn't actually progress the business forward. Yeah. So EOS and Clockify, again, Clockify is a new one. Um, so what are some, what are some habits that you think are important for entrepreneurs to adopt for themselves in addition to exercise and time management? Let's maybe add a couple more. I think one of the most important things to learn as an entrepreneur is how to delegate and how to hold people accountable. <sighs> And the delegation piece in the early days was really hard for me because you get like one, there's that time complex, right? Of it's faster for me to just do it. So I'm going to do it because we have a lot going on than it is to actually train the person. But then you have to think about the long term debt of time that that can cause where if you just spend the 30 minutes training them versus spending the two minutes to actually do it now you're saving yourself from that task multiple times down the road so learning how to properly delegate was something that took me a few years in the beginning to learn how to do properly and then the holding people accountable piece kind of ties into the eos tool but that's so important and you can't just rely on people telling you that they're doing great work like you have to have metrics to make sure it's getting done. Um, and look, again, it's you'd never want to be that manager who's micromanaging. You have to find that healthy balance of holding them accountable while also giving them the autonomy to get done what they know they need to get done. But to me, those are two very, very important skill sets. Yeah, definitely. And so thinking back to your own personal Amazon journey, what is one thing you wish you knew before you started your brand? So with ATAC, the undershirt brand, I wish I would have known early on uh, how hard it is to get a trademark. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how relevant that is to, to my actual agency business, but the it's very important to have your trademark and it's very important to not choose a trademark that is a generic term because you won't get it. <laughs> that would certainly make it hard. Everybody trying to get the same term. Um, yeah. 
Last two questions for you, Laura. What is your number one piece of advice to entrepreneurs starting their Amazon journey today? And would this be for those starting, like actually selling products on Amazon or would it be like a service Amazon business? Uh, products. So products. private label sellers okay. or even resellers, wherever you feel. Yeah. The, the seller side. So from this, from the seller perspective, you have to have a product that differentiates because what's happening as the Amazon ecosystem has matured is two things. One, if you're competing on price, the manufacturer direct model on Amazon is always going to undercut you in price and you can't, you can't win. And no one wants to be on that race to zero, right? So if you're just selling basic pens, what about your pen is so special? Like it can't just be a basic pen because there's pens being sold for a cheaper amount. And how do you compete with that? Honestly, you can't, um, unless you have a brand story or a product differentiation. And then the other thing that's happening with Amazon, especially in categories like fashion and beauty, and supplements and, C and CPG overall is the large businesses with deep pockets are coming to the platform and they are going all out on their advertising investment. So as a smaller business that needs to break through the noise, you have to have that hook. You have to have that point of differentiation and I also strongly believe that now a, a brand to be successful on Amazon also has to choose a channel off Amazon to also help build the flywheel, whether that is meta, whether that is TikTok, whether that is Reddit, you know, like there are so many creative things that you can do, but you have to zero in and commit on having fantastic, interesting products, and then fantastic, interesting stories that are going to capture people's attention so that you can stand out from just being another product in the SERP. Yeah. Cause the race to the bottom on price is, is a, a quick one and nobody wins at the end of the day. Yeah, Amazon wins. Well, the well, only Amazon person wins, wins right. is Amazon. <laughs> Not really. True. Cause if, uh, if eventually one caves out and then the prices go up, so it's constant cycles of down and up, down and up instead of being kind of steady and you might lose good brands along the way, or good players. So for sure. You have to, yeah. 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 And to close out the episode, Laura, a quick prediction from you on what is to come in the next 12 months on Amazon or in e-commerce in general. I think we've already started to see this even surface on LinkedIn and other you know forums of discussion. But I, I really think the power of brand is back. Mm -hmm. So for really the last 15 years, 10 years especially, it's been all about performance media. It's been, how are we driving low CAC, high LTV? And it's truly been a numbers game. And the objective side of business is getting disrupted again by the subjective side of business, which is how is this brand, how is this business making someone feel? And again, if you don't have that hook, your it's just your performance media is going to be far less efficient right because if people know about your brand and they trust your brand and then they also see you in the paid search your conversion rate therefore your a cost your tacos your cac etc it's going to be a lot lower than if you are a brand that no one's ever heard of and brand awareness is tricky because it's expensive and you know there's a famous quote in marketing right that half of your marketing isn't working. It's figuring out which half is the battle because <laughs> uh, you're always having to do testing and learning. But I think brands, one, are having to focus on how they can be more profitable because the performance media has gotten more expensive. And, you know, I think, and I'm even seeing this in our own portfolio, right? 
the brands that have excellent momentum, they continue to get bigger because consumer spending, it's there. It's not, it's not necessarily slowing down like some economists have been predicting the last few years. Um, it's just the big is getting bigger and some of the smaller businesses that maybe didn't have the right type of funding or really the right business plan, um, you know, they're just not, they're not able to break through the noise at this point because of how expensive customer acquisition has become. Yeah, I, I would agree. We've seen a lot of the same of that brand is very, very important and the advertising is only going to get more expensive. So you've got to build it now. Laura, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate all of your time and all of your expertise. And again, for anyone listening, if you want to learn more about Envision Horizons, you can check out their website at envisionhorizons.com or reach out to Laura's team directly at sales at envisionhorizons.com. But thank you again so much for being here. Thank you. It's thank a pleasure. You. And thank you for everyone who tuned in today. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts with us in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you all on the next one.